having me on the site and cool awesome so api connectors what are they how do we use them what were they built for what is the whole purpose behind them and most importantly how do i use it how do i benefit from it what can i do for integrations and much more now the very first thing is that you've probably been seeing the api connectors for quite some time inside of config without them doing too much because they were just being prepared in the background to make sure that all the devices that are going to connect to them are working properly of the communication protocols are established and we have uh kind of hold the whole base to be able to work our way up from there now it's probably been poking you in the eye in config since version 12.2 or 12.4 uh, maybe the public beta but since uh, the release of version 13 everything has already been integrated that we needed it and as you can see new devices that came out for example touch pure flex the new Entcom and more are using the api connectors already but there's much more to it i think last week we briefly did see how the api connector is involved in the digital showroom but we can do much much more with it than just that especially when it comes to integration with third party systems now if you go into a live demo we're going to build a few api connectors we're going to look into config and go into a bit more detail and go obviously more technical in terms of what we need so let me make sure we're sharing the correct screen yes we are and let's dive into config so i've built a very very clean and simple config file there's not too much information because we don't need it we have a lighting controller doing an rgbw strip and just one circuit of wall lights well simulating wall lights our present center um, we have a speaker in here to demonstrate intelligent room controller that is just uh, connected to an electric heater which is on a relay and we have uh, venetian blinds because that's usually something that you also have on the connector so the very first thing that i want to mention is the connector itself So as you can see, it has a different place. I'm going to actually remove this for now. So it's outside of the way. It has a different place. It's not connected exactly to one of the outputs. It's at the very bottom and it's part of the block. Why is that? It's because the API connector uh, itself Yeah, you are. Um, the API connector is an input and an output so to that connector if you have let's say a virtual text input connected or you have your intercom you have something working in the background that can send and receive data both ways and there are a few blocks or a few devices that are already using them so the very first one that probably quite a few of you have noticed already is going to be the nano 2 relay tree the shading actuator the nano motor controller and everything that has to do with shading and let's look into it and see why that is the case so i'm just going to add in here well i have an air base so let me do something different i'm going to add a shading actuator air we'll go down here as soon as you start creating the device it's obviously asking you for a description this is going to be doing i don't know my curtains i'm going to put it in the dining room and then under application we have one of two things that we can choose one is automatic blinds which is what that is the device is designed for or you can use it universally so you can use the shading actuator to switch on um, lights on the outside of the house or any two relays that are going um, so for example if you have a garage door rolling shutters you can use the relays to open and close but it's going to be a universal application it's not necessarily going to be for blinds however if we leave it to automatic blinds above blinds this is my installation location as soon as i drag the shading actuator on the page it's going to get that ac, uh, AC 
or API connector. I drop it and it creates its own block. Why is that? Because, well, config already knows that this is a sharing actuator. We already know that it's supposed to do one thing and one thing only, lift the blinds up or get them down. We know what uh, command we can send from the uh, automatic shading block, which is complete up, complete down, up, down, and so on. So we don't need to overcomplicate it. The first relay goes up, the second relay goes down, and all of that is already built in the logic because this is the intended purpose. If we were to change this from automatic blinds to universal, now it's going to split the relays apart. It's going to give us our current flow detection and all of that can be used somewhere else for a different purpose. Now, another block or another device that has it and is very, very similar is going to be the NFC code touch and the intercom. So the NFC code touch actually lets out the device itself. Go NFT code touch. There it is. Description. We don't need one. Installation location. Front door. As soon as we open it, we can see a few things. We can see a digital inputs from the keypad, um, keypad, and we can see the API connector. If you start dragging out the API connector, again, it's going to create its own block because we already know what this is supposed to do. So instead of having multiple different inputs, outputs, one for every single button, one for the bell, one for uh, whatever access is authorized or closed, instead of that, we just have the API connector, which is doing all of that in the background, and it's communicating with the device. So that is how the block itself, so the NFC call touch function block and the NFC call touch the device are speaking in the background saying, okay, I want to do X, forward that information to the device, or whenever the device does something, it's forwarding the information to the block. Previously, we had that already integrated in every single block, but it was designed inside the block itself. So the block was seeing, okay, there's the device, it's taking the serial number, and all of that was integrated in. However, that changed to the API connector, because now that is much more scalable of a solution because you don't have to create a specific block and that block is only taking specific serial numbers. This way around, as long as we know what commands we want to send to the device, it's much easier to build everything in the background and for ground up, make sure everything's working. Now, one of the best use cases for API connectors is also integrating with third-party systems. And we're going to look into why exactly the NFC, why the intercom, and all of these devices that we already have. However, before that, I want to go uh, back to last week and we want to go back to the, the virtual showroom and how the virtual showroom actually works in the background. So I'm going to give you a sneak peek. I have created a little document in here on the site. I will grab. and show you a few commands from the virtual showroom. So you have your Fire Stick, it's plugged into the TV. It, the video is going, things are happening, the, the room is changing, lights are turning on, music is increasing. All of this is happening without our input. So there's no one sitting in the back on the phone and just trying to time everything up. It is, um, everything's happening obviously automatically and that's the whole purpose of it. Now, what is actually happening in the background? The video is going and at specific timestamps. So let's say at one minute, we send the command to turn on the lights or whenever something is happening in the video, let's say someone says, okay, and then the doorbell rings. We send a quick command to the intercom block to simulate the doorbell ringing, and then we can hear the sounds through the speakers. Same with the shading, send a quick pause to open the shades, send a quick pause to close them back in and we have multiple commands at different times in the video to make sure that the uh, virtual experience or the digital experience store is more interactive than just you sitting in there and watching a very, very boring video that makes little to no sense because you have no, um, no interaction with the whole system. Now, 
in terms of building everything, it's actually not that difficult. N maybe quite a few of you have already tried um, the web services or the web commands that we have in some instances. So if you don't know, to the mini server, you can send HTTP commands from any browser. So it can be on my phone, I can be on an iPad, I can be running Safari, whatever it is, of the local network or even externally. And I want to run a few tests or I want to switch a couple of things on, but I don't necessarily want to go to the app or I don't have access to the app, but I do have access to the mini server in some way. Now the best or the fastest way to do it sometimes is to just put a quick command in and say, okay, set a pulse to switch on the lights to see if it's working on the local network and also to see if anything's wrong with the system. We can also use uh, the web service or the web commands to be able to troubleshoot quickly. Now, I'm going to create a little template. I'm going to show you how that works. But before that, let's go to config and talk about the basics. So the number one device that uses the API connector is going to be the touch pure flex. Now I know it's quite dark, but if we do this, there we go. Should be able to see a little bit better, but we have the touch pure flex. You can obviously use it as any other switch. However, in the background, because the touch pure flex, uh, touch pure flex is so unique, and obviously every single thing that's engraved on it is going to have a different functionality, or maybe the customer wants to use it in a different way, then be, because of that, oh, wrong camera. Because of that is the second reason, or maybe even the primary reason in some cases to actually build the API connector because you want to have a quick and easy way to modulate and move things around. So not everything is fixed. Not everything is, okay, you press in here and then send a pulse. You might want to press and hold on the touch pure flex to increase, decrease brightness. You might want to use the up and down arrows. That's completely fine. And then depending on what you need is, there's so many uh, variables that can change and will probably change that we want to be able to address them all. And that is also another reason why we build that great base for the API connector in the first place. Now, if we go and look at the Pure Flex itself, it does have an API connector. That API connector connects the same way. And at, I think the 15th of December, we're going to go into more depth about the device itself, how to use it, how to configure one. But today we're just briefly going to mention it. So what we want to do is we want to do a few examples. Now, the very first one would be simply turning the lights on. So we want to be able to send a pulse to the lighting controller, which is then going to go to the mini server and then the mini server is going to say, okay, turn on the lights. As I said, that can be done from any browser on the local network or we can do it externally. And I'm going to show you how to go about it. Now, if we open a web browser, oh, wrong web browser, there we go. So we have this document, which I am going to show in the chat for everyone. There we go. Can everyone see the document or did, it, did, I not, did that not go through? I think it should be fine. Okay, but worst case scenario, again, I can send you a quick email to everyone to make sure that this goes through. Cool. So in this document, yes, but we can chat. Amazing. How do we make you chat? Panels can chat with everyone. Attendees can chat with 
everyone try now. Whoa! Awesome. Amazing. Amazing. That makes everything 10 times easier. Whew. God bless. So now the document, I'm glad that you have it. If you pull it up on your screen or if you just put it on the side for now, then what we want to do with this one is we want to have a quick read through or kind of see what all the commands are about, how we build them and so on. There's also a section that is missing here that I'm going to create on the screen for you. So a few things that we want to do, we want to be able to, first of all, send commands to the touch. We want to be able to send commands to uh, the audio player, lighting controller, uh, intelligent room controller and so on pretty much every single block in the app and then whenever we send them sometimes it's just a pulse so you want to send a one and a zero to say okay switch something on or potentially you want to set a specific value maybe you want to set the volume of the speakers to 100 percent, or you want to set the brightness level or the overall brightness level to 60 percent, something similar so we can do either a set as an analog or a set as a digital, just single pulse being sent through. So one or a zero is going to be constant and a pulse is gonna be a quick pulse. Then if we go further down the list, we have set T5. And I think you can pretty much guess what this one is. As you know, we have the five touch points on the touches, uh, touch pure, the regular one, and every single point does something specific and they're all kind of integrated in all the basic blocks. So the intelligent room controller, um, sorry, the audio player block, the lighting controller, the shading controller, everything that has to do uh, something with the touch is already integrated in. So whenever we press the middle, we want something to happen. Whenever we play the left-hand side, we want something to happen. And we expect to have a uh, repetitive type of action. So it's going to be the same throughout every single switch. So that's why we can say, hey, send a pulse to T5 and set a pulse to point number three. And point number three is obviously the middle for the lights. So just going to send a quick pulse and switch the lights on. If we go further down, we can set analog inputs the same way as I was speaking. So in our case, we can send music values. We can say comfort temperatures and everything else. And then if we continue down, we can set times for schedule. We can do wait functions. So if you want to execute something and then you want to wait X amount of seconds, or you want to wait X amount of seconds before something happens, we can integrate that in. So a bit of a delay, if you want to say so. We can get information from blocks. So input, output information, and so on. And to be honest, most of these are actually for the um, touch pure flex because obviously you have that screen on the device and you want to be able to output some information so the customer knows what's happening. So for example, if you press the lights, it's going to say we're currently in, in bright setting, we're currently on night mode, whatever is set, you want to display it. Or if you're adjusting the volume up and down, you want to know what percentage is currently being set. Echo, it's great for kind of getting the last information from the block. So this is going to just fetch some information saying, okay, the block is currently locked or the mood is set to X, volume is Y and so on. Just feed you back some information, but it's going to be the default block information. And then you can do that in a web browser, but you can do it on the touch pure flex. You can chain commands. So if you want to execute one thing after another and just keep on going, you can just change them, uh, chain them with an end sign so basically say this command and that command and just keep on going and then we're going to look at the, the rest nesting having both commands in the same statement so let's build one together and see how we are going to approach it so what do we need to build a command i'm going to grab one of these there we go. And let's start here, actually. 
So we need the IP or the other way around, mini server's IP. So we need to know where we're sending that command to. We need to know what command we're sending. So commands I want to send or what action do I want to happen? And also we need a virtual text input. So we have somewhere to send it to. Then we build the command and execute, but I'll show you that. So the two most important things for us is going to be the virtual text input and the mini server IP to be able to send them through. If you also want to send the command from a third party device that obviously needs to send that information to the mini server, um, but it obviously needs to authenticate. So the password needs to go through first. You can do admin column password at mini server's IP. Oh, let's put it that way. IP. And now in here is where the actual command starts. So we go developer or dev SPS IO. Then I'm actually going to make that screen bigger. And then what command do we want sent? Now, if we do that together, so the first command that we sent is just going to be a very simple pulse. We're going to pulse one of the inputs on the lighting controller to switch the lights on. So, and in our case, we also need to address the API connector, but we'll look into that in a sec. So let's go to, where did that go? Let's go to this and see what we want. So we want to set a digital input because we're just going to send a quick pulse and we want to send it to the lighting controller. Now, after version 13 of config, every single block now has a short abbreviation. It has a short name and the short name is what we're actually going to be using to address every single block because you don't want to be typing out intelligent temperature controller. You don't want to be typing out all the longer names, sequential controllers, and so on. You just want to say, okay, LYCO, which is LICO for the lighting controller, or we'll look into, for example, the audio player, it's just AP and much more. But all of that information we can easily find. Where'd you find it? If we go in config and any controller that I want, for example, the lighting controller, if I click on more information, so on the I is going to hit, tell me in the brackets in here, what is the short name or the abbreviation for the lighting controller? And in this case is Lyco or lighting controller. Lyco, Lyco, you know. And the shortest one I think is definitely going to be the audio player, which is just AP. Now, capitalization matters. so please be uh, careful whenever typing something in. The first letter is always capital and then the rest uh, are just lowercase. And then with some controllers, for example, the intelligent room controller, we have a version one for old systems and version two uh, for the newer systems. So in here we can actually see we have IRC two. So the new generation is always gonna be the second one. Awesome. Now, let's do a few steps together. And I'm actually going to, for example, remove this API connector. So as I said, we do need a virtual text input. Now, it doesn't really matter what exactly you name this input, something that makes sense for you for switching things on and off, but it's always good to have no spaces in the name because it's easier to address because otherwise you have to put like percentage 20 signs for every single space that you have in. So let's do that together and go about it. So we're going to virtual inputs. 
virtual text input on the top. And let's give a name for, I don't know, if we call it web control, for example, because that's how we're going to be controlling this one. This is not a T5, it's not a switch, it's not a push. We're going to be sending web commands. So in this case, it makes sense. However, you can call this one anything that you like. You can call it Teletubbies if you want to, completely up to you. So I'll drag it in here. And where do we want to connect it? Well, we want to make sure that the uh, lighting controller is working. So we'll drag it, connect it to the AC for the API connector and save in the mini server. Okay, program identical. And then we go back to the template that we're building. Now in here, what we can do is, well, what we need to do is need, we need to address where we're sending that signal to. In our case, we're sending it to an input output and that input output in our is going to be called web control. And then in here, oh, sorry, your virtual text input. And then in here, we have the command. So let's build an example together. Now, in my case, I don't need to put my um, admin username and password because I'm going to type it in manually. However, if you need to, you obviously go username, password, and then everything else. As I said, I don't need to, although my password is demo case. I know you all remember it. I'm not trying to hide it away. And let's see how I'm going to build it in this scenario. I go to my mini server to check what my IP is. There it is. So I put the IP, then I can go dev, SPS, input output. And now we can go to the virtual text input, put its name in. In this instance, it's called web control. And now we want to build one of the commands. What I was thinking for this example is that we can either use the plus and minus um, on the lighting controller to just go to the next scene. And I think it's going to be just simple and easy to go pulse it and not care about T5s in the first place. So we want to be able to set the lighting controller. We want to be able to set the status of the input. As I said, we need the lighting controller and we need the short abbreviation, which is going to be Lyco. Then we put a semicolon in here to be able to divide. And now we need to know which input we're calling. So as I said, I am looking at M plus or M minus just to go to the next mood or the previous mood, something that we can easily pause and then it's going to instantly give us some kind of an outcome. So M plus is what I'm thinking about. So let's go back M plus. And what I want to do, I want to simply pulse it. And that is going to be the whole command I need. And that is following that exact template. However, because I'm not sending it from a third party device, I don't need the admin, um, so the username and password, I can just put the mini server's IP and then I'm going to log in myself manually. So let's grab this. And actually, let me do this as well for you guys. That is going to the chat. There we go. How long is the pause? The pause is normal duration, which is 0.3 seconds. Is it adjustable? Um, not exactly, or at least I don't know how to adjust it from here directly. However, you can put a wait statement. You can wait for a couple of seconds and then go again, or you can set it to one, and then you can send another command to set it to zero. So if the pause is supposed to be, let's say one minute, you can set a command, wait for one minute and set the command back in. So one, then go back to zero. 
let's grab this and go to a web browser. Now web browser, as I said, it can be any web browser of your choice. You pause, it, you pause the command in and I'm actually going to change cameras. There we go. Press enter. It's going to ask me obviously for credentials. And there we go. So how do we address multiple blocks on a single page using this command, a automatic shading blocks? So I assume, let me change back. So I assume you mean, how do I use multiple API inputs or multiple virtual inputs? For example, if I want to remove these ones, I absolutely can. And I can use that same virtual text input for every single block. I don't need to create a second one. Save in. And then because I'm sending specific information, so for example, I'm sending the information to which block I want to switch on. In this example, the lighting controller, I'm also sending the information of which input specifically I want to switch on and the pools that I'm sending it. There's no way for the API connector to really get it wrong and send, let's say, a pulse to um, the speakers, a pulse to the lighting controller, uh, a pulse to the intelligent room controller, and so on. It's always going to be sending to that specific block at that page. Um, if you're asking in terms of can I use that same signal or can I uh, use a single command to multiple devices at the same time. Not really. We need to just change them and uh, chain them and have them like a second apart. So instead of going um, one command to all at the same time, we're just going to go one, two, three, four, and just going to keep sending commands to devices. So if you want a lot of things to be happening at the same time, we just need to get them apart by like half a second or 0.3 seconds, whatever it is. Okay, and going back to yeah, that's a good question. So if the web control is connected to multiple light lighting controllers, how do we know which one is the correct one to address and how do we address the correct one? Now, again, multiple ways to approach the same scenario. So if you want to, in the lighting, uh, in the in the command itself, we can also specify the room that we're sending it to. So make sure that we're sending it to the right room. However, I'll say a slightly better practice is the virtual input or the virtual text input is not that intensive when it comes to uh, memory usage and all the connect, um, all the CPU power that is using in the background. So I'll personally just split multiple virtual inputs. So I'll maybe have one virtual input called lighting controller, well, API lighting controller one, API lighting controller two, or API lighting controller living room and so on. And I'll just keep adding them on top. That way I basically can't get it wrong because even if I'm sending that exactly the same command, if I have a second virtual uh, a second virtual input or virtual text input that is just called something else, and only this one is connected to a lighting controller, then basically I can use it this way around. Or if you want to, let's say use a lighting central block, then a lighting central block is not like us, but I think it's like with C or something. So basically that is, I'll say one of the easiest ways to approach it. Otherwise you can go and say living room and address the specific blocks. So actually that's a good scenario to run ourselves through. 
but I will show you that in a second as well. So now that we know how to send a pulse, what if I want to do something else? What if I want to play music? Send a quick pull, um, a quick pulse to music. Uh, what exactly do I need to do, and how they approach it, or how do we just look into different? Let's just look into a different scenario, so we can build it up and know. Okay, that's what I need to do. Now, pretty much everything. If you're using ex uh, exactly the same virtual input, the everything to this point is going to be exactly the same. But then, what is going to change? is going to be the command at the end that we're addressing. So if we go back to our template, oh, sorry, again, wrong one. There we go. What I would like to do in this case is I want to send two commands, or I want to send one command after another. The first one is I have a speaker in here. And I want to play the speaker. And then the second command is I want to increase the volume. And I want to increase it to a specific uh, percentage. So not just step it up by a bit. I want to set it up to, let's say, 100%. So we can use set again. Like This is most likely going to be the one command that you use all the time. But we want to get set. We want to set a function block, the input, and value. So let's build it together. Now. What I want to do is I want to first play it, and then I want to change it. All right, I'll go back to this in a second. But virtual text is put being added to the block. I'll put on the right hand side. It doesn't look great in config. Should light or up the block with the UI. That is, yeah, that is a good question. I don't know, but knowing how everything is, so the, the, the honest answer is I don't know, but knowing how everything works in config and how things improve over time, I assume the developers are going to take that into account and say, okay, what else can we do? As we already have like the aligning block functionality, which is obviously made to make everything look prettier, everything's organized. So maybe something like that could happen in the future, but I can't say yes or no for sure. So uh, back to our example, I want to play music and we want to set the volume at a specific level. So again, we're going to grab set. We need to get the short name of the block. So I want to switch on the audio player. I go to I for more information and I want to play. So that's what this is called. So AP, semicolon, play, and I want to pause it. And then let's prepare it now. So we have it. Now pretty much everything is going to be the same. However, I'm not gonna be using play. I want to adjust the volume and the volume is I think V, but let's check it together. So it's set a specific volume. Yep, volume is simply V. So we want to have V, and in my case, I'm going to put it like 70, 75% because my headphones are noise canceling, so I hope everyone can hear on the other side. Now let's first play music, and then we'll try to increase the volume. So I grab that command. Again, let me send the commands to you as well. We we'll first grab the pulse. Go to a web browser. Hopefully to the right one this time. Send it through. Now. My headphones are noise canceling. As soon as that command goes through, it's pretty much instant. So I send it, I click enter, and that goes in and gets sent to my mini server that goes to the audio server, and everything works. If I do exactly the same, but with the volume, let me grab it, put it in. And now I'll just take my headset. So hopefully, okay. 
And also because I have it built already, I can easily say, okay, set it back to 25 because it's too loud. And then immediately it switches quickly to 25% volume and it gives me what I want. Now, where can that be useful? As you know, we are very, very open to integrations, especially when it comes to the new library and all the features that came uh, from it. So if you have multiple systems or you have third party devices that need to send a signal to Loxon, as long as they can send a simple HTTP command, it can make a couple of things switch on and switch off. For example, it might be, well, we might go into a little bit too much depth. Let me just pause the music. There we go. Uh, for example, let's say you're working on a very big hotel. Uh, you have 80 hotel rooms. You have uh, kind of a booking system. There's an entity called Touch, and you want to be able to quickly create new users. Uh, you want to be able to create a new uh, code or maybe delete an old user or generate a code for that the, the stay of that person. Well, they already have some kind of a booking system working in the background. They already have um, maybe a software developer or a website developer that is doing some work for them. And these people also know how to send just a simple HTTP string. So if you tell them, hey, send a string whenever someone checks in and get that into Loxon, then we can decide, okay, how do they book him? What is the best procedure to do? Basically, we can automate a whole process in the background and have the full integration. Another thing that's cool, let's say you have maybe a different sound system and that different sound system can also send HTTP uh, outputs. Then we can make sure that everything's at the same volume. You can increase, decrease volume from a, for a different zone and vice versa, obviously. And last but not least is a little example, let's say temperature controls. If you have some kind of a third party smart thermostat that can send a value, maybe just whatever the person goes and presses, let's say 25, 30 degrees and so on. That value we can also send direct to the mini server and say, okay, set the comfort temperature to X and get the system optimized that way. So very, very flexible. It's it, like the top behind has been obviously there for quite a long time, but now it's here. It works absolutely great. And i have say in some cases, Whenever you get yourself more familiar with the commands, it might be even easier to just go command in instead of going to the app, going to the room that you want to and doing that specific function. Obviously, a few things can come with experience. However, I have no doubt that I already know a few of you are very technical savvy and you actually abuse that function. So you, you don't need to use it sparingly. That's all I wanted to say. You can use it as much as you want. It's not really going to break anything. Cool. Now, the other thing or the other device that uses it that I want to look into is going to be the Touch Pure Flex and basically how to, what to keep in mind whenever you have a Touch Pure Flex and you have the API connector. So on the device, Humidity, temperature, LED one, display, all of that is available. Custom display text, you can send it this way, but that is not intended purpose. Intended purpose is to be able to um, just send a quick command whenever something is pressed, and then that command knows what exactly needs to happen. So on the touch pure flex that I have here, it's, it's one even lower. So hopefully you guys can see. There we go. Okay, a bit more visible now. Stop the lights. And now, I don't know how visible it is, but at the top, I have a little light symbol and I have the display at the bottom. Depending on what I choose, we can go through different scenes. It's going to give me display. It's going to feed back the information to me. Parties of, you can double tap, triple tap, all of the other function functionality we can build in. But I'll say a better one, probably going to be music. So if I go play music, 
I have set it to toggle play pause. And then you can see the volume. I can use the arrows up and down to increase, decrease volume. I can go pause it, play again, volume up. And you can see the volume is changing on the device. Pause it back. And how does that actually work in the background? If I go to Touch Pure Flex, go to Edit Configuration, I am sure you can see it in here 10 times better than what's on the device because of how dark it is. However, that's what I have in front of me. I have um, music, temperature control, different modes, so training, uh, presentations, living room, and so on. And as you can see, the device itself is using the same kind of functions or the same pulses, inputs, outputs as the API connector. That's exactly how it's built. So whenever I click on something, it's going to take me to the right area. So for example, the lights. Now, what I can do in here is I can say, whenever I press this, what is supposed to happen? I can go and type it myself manually. So in this case, I did, I just said, set T5 to the lighting controller, pulse T5 slash one, so the first input, pulse number three on the T5, so the light, and then it, it just sends the pulse itself. However, that can be changed. And also we can simplify this a little bit. So if I go to a gear knob, I can say, hey, which function block do I want to address? Yes, it's gonna be the lighting controller. Which input do I want to trigger? Let's say in our case, we want to do something else. Maybe we want to, I don't know, go to the plus instead. What command do I want to use? Do I want to set a pulse? Do I want to have a menu selector? Do I want to select values? I just want to set a pulse. And then automatically, we're just going to pulse. Say OK. And now if I save in the mini server, go to the camera, so you can see, you go and press it, and it sends the command to go to the next mood, next mood, next mood, until it stops. And then again, if you double tap in here, it's going to work. As you see, let's, uh, let's turn the light on. Double tap, because what it's doing, it's sending two pulses to the lighting controller, and it's also fast enough to react within 0.3 seconds twice. So that just um, shows even more how powerful the connector is or how quick it works. Now, what if I want to do something a bit more complex? What if I want to be able to display some information on the device and be able to use the up and down arrows? That is also an API function that's already built in. So if I go touch pure flex, edit, I've already set it up in here, but basically what do I want to do? Whenever I use the up and down arrows, I want to know what is the current volume or what volume I have set. How can I find out that from config? Well, let's use a bit of logic. So I'm using the up and down arrows to increase or decrease the volume, which means what exactly we're triggering the volume up or volume down every single time we press them. So up arrow is going to be volume up whenever selected, down arrow is going to be volume down and so on. And then what I want to get as a feedback, I want to get a feedback information from the output. So what is the current volume? So volume output currently 25%, but if I keep increasing up and down, that is obviously going to change. So if I go, 28, 34, 35. So I can use that, or I can use the output from the block to get that information on the screen of the device. And then that is going to show me what's currently going on. Great for temperature, great for music, 
great for even shading to be able to see what is the current percentage of opening or closing and that's how we can use it now quickly how to build that command if we go back into our slides uh, down 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 so value select we talk about in terms of this is basically building the whole function in one um, in one device so you can say what is the input what is minimum value maximum value default value what steps do we need to take all of that can be adjusted but actually what we want to look at in this case is just the output so you want to be able to print some nice text or in some cases you want to output that text to a third party system so you want to know what the current value is so we use get output and then this is what we have let me put it in here as well get output command get output command so my ip is going to be exactly the same two one or two let me go dev sps io web control however the command changes at the end so we run the function block which in my case is ap one output which is called volume and now in here why do we have value one text one and so on simple let's say you want to display temperature information you want to either have like cells have like celsius or a little degree symbol on top if you want to display uh, display music you might want to have a percentage sign so basically that's what we can do so if you want to we can say well value one is going to be exactly the same but that is going to be in percentages or it can be volume celsius and so on i'll just put percent for now let's grab that command and go to our web browser that goes in send and in this case it actually doesn't output in let me just get this out it doesn't return the value to me why one of two uh, cases i'm running the latest alpha so it might be that it's the alpha version or it might be me that's not doing something right however this function or these functions the get output set volume select volume and so on they're built for the api connected specifically and the uh, touch pure flex so that is when they're they're meant to be used now it's good it's still good to know how you can build it however it's built for that little screen and to be able to display it back not to just uh, regurgitate that information in plain text in http awesome do we have any questions i'm pretty sure that there are probably quite a few or did i forget to send you one of these so that we send the last few okay if we don't have any Let me obviously talk about last few bits. So as you know, every single webinar that we have now, we do, can you view live HTTP commands in both? Amazing. That is a very, very good question. So I have my live view currently on. And because this is a virtual text input, we can see in real time if the command is being sent so if you want to troubleshoot it's an absolutely amazing tool so going to live view and being able to see okay what command has been sent to the device and if it's actually been sent to the mini server or you maybe there's something on the network that is preventing that command from going through but yes it's a virtual text input so whenever you send it through you're going to be able to see the command um, come up on this side and then it's basically going to be the same command with every single block because it's, it's the same input 
if you like. Yep, there you go. Now, the poll is very, very simple. <clears throat> because you came in today, you participated, you're getting 50% off from update training. Now, I think we have one or two dates, maybe just one date left because a lot of people booked on the previous one. But let's run the poll. Of course, you can, by all means, launched. There we go. Of course, you can choose that, hey, I don't want to do training now. I can do training next year. But maybe two things to keep in mind. First, best price we'll get. And second, from next year, everything that is running in the background of the system is automatic. So to keep, obviously, partner states and so on. One space left for online training and two for in person. There we go. So if everyone, if anyone wants to, one space left online. So if you're far away, that's great. And in person, obviously, it's much much better when it comes to networking. We feed you in here. Um, there's beer on the house and everything else. So and you get to meet us, which I think is an awesome benefit. And we will start adding more dates for next year. So. Quickly going to what's coming up. So these are the two dates. You can already see them in the webinar. But next webinars, new products, energy topic or energy metering in Luxon. We're going to go to the power supply and backup and the layout of the panel because we're doing a little bit of a change for our own panel now that we have the new device. We're going to do some planning and design for hospitality projects. And then we'll end up the year with full configuration of Touch Pure Flex from the designing tool. So from the configurator, going all the way down to what commands you want to set. And if you actually want to set the commands whenever you're configuring it, so as soon as you plug it into your mini server, it's going to uh, work automatically. Or if you want to do it at a later stage, it's absolutely fine. So I think if you go to partner webinar page, you can already register. There we go. Kieran is giving us some useful information. So we will add the 2023 dates for uh, the end of the next webinar on Thursday. So hopefully see you next week as well. And then we are going to, um, you're already able to register for a partner webinar for next week. So thank you very much all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next week. Cheers, stay green.